Hello and welcome to Rotary Presents A Taste for Charity, our virtual cooking event. I'd like to welcome you and introduce myself. My name is Sue Godey. I'm the Youth Services Director for the Rotary Club of Lions Gate. Just a bit about Rotary. We are an international service organization with 1.2 million members in over 120 countries and 55,000 clubs. The Rotary Club of Lions Gate was chartered 42 years ago, and since then our focus has been youth and youth at risk. You may know us through several of our signature events, including Canada Day at Waterfront Park, and of course Operation Red Nose, brought to you in conjunction with the three other clubs on the North Shore with a safe drive home during the holiday season. Some of our youth recipients have been Hollyburn Family Services, North Shore Youth Safe House. We present annual scholarships to students at graduating from local high schools in School District 44. Backpack Buddies, a program where the organization provides food for kids over the weekend. And last but not least, the Boys and Girls Club of North Vancouver and their summer campership program. I won't get into too much detail about the camp, however, you will see a clip later on this evening and which will fill you in on much more detail. We've been very proud to support this initiative and help families send their kids to summer camp to enjoy a week or two weeks in the sun and just be a kid. I have a secret. This has been pre-recorded. This will allow you to stop and start at any time during the preparation of your meal. Make sure that, you that it happens at your own pace. Also, we have live operators this evening. We have Chef Jonah and John, our wine expert. If you get stuck or if you'd like to ask questions, there's also Rotarians and a representative of the Boys and Girls Club that would love to chat with you. Don't forget to send in those pictures. We'd love to see your final product. Please use hashtag Rotary Presents, a taste for charity, or hashtag Rotary Lions Gate. Thank you very much for your support, and I will now turn it over to the chefs. It's my pleasure to introduce Chef Jonah Joffrey and John Merrill from the Salt and Earth Catering Company. These gentlemen will guide us through this evening's meal using the freshest of BC ingredients. I wish you bon appetit and hope that you enjoy your meal and thank you again for your support. Over to you, John and Jonah. Good evening everyone and welcome to the Rotary Club of Lionsgate presents A Taste of Charity. I'm Jonah Jaffe. I'm John Merrill. And we're here to cook dinner tonight in support of the Boys and Girls Club. Before we get going, I'm going to take everybody through their packages and their list of ingredients. And don't mind what I have in front of me. We have people cooking different variations of dinner tonight. So I have some ingredients that you may not have, but your friends cooking down the street will have possibly a different package. So we're going to start at the back. I have a lacinato kale that I've just taken off the stem and I've chiffonnade it quickly, and we're gonna put that into our risotto to finish. We have a trim French bean that we're gonna finish in a little bit of vegetable stock, and if you don't have a dairy allergy, we're gonna put a little bit of butter in it for a bit of extra taste. I have some par-cooked risotto, and so I've par-cooked the risotto for us tonight to try and pick up the pace and try and make us not spend 45 minutes just only standing at the stove cooking rice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we have some zucchini for the vegetarians and vegans cooking with us, some vegetable stock, some grape tomatoes, a shallot, and some capers for the sauce vierge that we'll be making, some fresh lemons, and then we have a little bit of yogurt, some feta, some parmesan, and some butter. Sweet. All the artery cloggers. Perfect. There we go. Like it. And... In our little herb bundle, we have a combination of Italian parsley, chive, tarragon, mint, and dill. So between the two of those, we're going to make the sauce vierge. And the other half of this, we're going to make the herb yogurt and the herb salad for the vegetarian dish. Before we get going too far, I'm just going to ask everybody to take their vegetable stock and we're going to put it on the stove and we're going to put it to about a medium heat and we're going to start warming that up to help cook our risotto. 
And while that's warming up, we're also going to start preheating our oven. So we're going to turn that up to 400. Everybody tonight has been provided with a nice bowl of vegetarian, gluten-free minestrone soup. So now I'm just going to put a little bit into this bowl and we're just going to show everybody what's inside. So it's a nice tomato vegetable broth. We have butternut squash, zucchini, cannellini beans, some chickpeas, uh, some lemon juice, and a little bit of parsley to add a little bit of freshness and acidity to finish the bowl of soup off. Nice. And was this soup vegan as well? Soup is completely vegan. Yeah, it's a oh, veg amazing. Ve vegetable okay. a little, base. A little added bonus there. Yeah, exactly. So nice, nice, fresh, warm bowl of soup to get everybody started this evening. And we didn't garnish it, but you can garnish it however you want. If you've got microgreens or if you like parsley in your soup or olive oil, by all means, fill your boots. Absolutely. So I've also provided the recipe so that you can make it at home. And yeah, enjoy. The first thing that we're going to do tonight is we're going to start by making our herb yogurt and picking the herbs for our herb salad for the zucchini dish. So if you could just pass me two of those small bowls. Absolutely. We're going to take the mint and dill from our herb packages and we're going to reserve a little piece of mint to garnish our dessert with later. So you can just take one sprig of mint, nice. put that in another bowl and then we'll put that in the fridge and we'll come back to that later. So we're just going to start by taking all the dill off of some of the hardier stems and then we'll do that with the mint as well. I'm just going to... Should I do a little picking here myself as well? Sure, jump in speed there. Speed things up. Speed things up. Why not? And if you haven't done so, it's probably about time to pour yourself a drink as well. We're going to be here for a while, so might as well have a nice buzz on. So once we have all of our herbs picked, we're going to run our knives through them uh, just very roughly and leave them kind of coarse and rustic. We're going to reserve half of that for the salad and the other half we're going to put into the other bowl and we're going to use that to start our yogurt. Perfect. So we're just going to take one pass through our herbs. And then we'll mix those together on the board so we have a nice combo of the dill and the mint. We'll put half into the one bowl and that will be our herb salad. And we'll just take our knife through it one more time, go a little finer, and that'll be the base for the yogurt. It smells great. Love fresh dill. Now we're going to take the yogurt out of your package. We're just going to mix it into the bowl. We'll take the feta next and we'll use our microplane and just zest that into the bowl so that we can break that down and it'll be nice and smooth in there. And if they don't have a fancy microplane, they can probably just use a regular cheese grater. A regular grater yeah. is fine. If you have a box grater, there's the small attachments on the side. If it's a little more coarse, it doesn't matter. If you don't have either, you can crumble it by hand. Anything goes with this. It's really a nice, comforting home, home meal. Yeah. So. Watch yourself with these bad boys. I've taken a lot of skin over the years. I'm a little bit more of a blunt instrument in the kitchen, so definitely be careful. Now that we have the feta in with our yogurt, we're going to take one of our lemons, we're just going to zest half of it into the bowl. Shake that off so we get all the goodies. And now we're just going to mix it gently. When we're mixing the yogurt, you don't want to mix too vigorously. If we go at it too quickly, it's going to add a lot of air into the yogurt and it's going to force it to break down and you're going to end up with a really liquidy mixture, which just is not very pleasant to eat or mm -hmm. look at. Now our yogurt is ready. I'll pass these to you. Absolutely. Put those in the into fridge. the fridge. looks good for now. Now we're going to start by making our sauce for our fish for tonight for everybody eating the lingcod. So we have some grape tomatoes. 
We're going to start by just cutting them lengthwise. We're going to cut them lengthwise again and then in half. So we just end up with these nice little pieces again. You can do that with all of the tomatoes. So each tomato basically in an eighth. Um, Into eight pieces, okay. yeah. Yep. So longwise and across. For the love of God, use a sharp knife too. It's going to make your life a lot easier. It's yeah. going to make your salad look a little crisper instead of having a little salsa on your plate when we're done. If you haven't done so yet, invest in good knives. They're a little intimidating at first. You're going to have a couple cuts and scrapes here and there, but it makes your life a lot easier. I'm trying not to swear here as well. It makes your life a lot easier. I'm from the Maritimes, so I have a bit of a mouth on me sometimes, but I'm, I'm here to clean it up tonight anyways. Can you pass me that other bowl? I <laughs> sure can. <laughs> so we're going to throw our tomatoes into the bowl. We're going to take our shallot. I'm just going to trim the ends of my shallot off. Sometimes they're a little dry. Sometimes they don't take the cores off very well. Just going to cut it in half, and then we're just going to split it again. We're just going to get some nice shapes out of it. If you have a rounder one, you can just cut it straight across here. It doesn't really matter about specifics. If you want to small dice it, do whatever you'd like. It's really a nice, uh, homey, very delicious, fresh salsa when we're all done with it. Mm -hmm. We've got that instant burn in the eyes too. There you I'm go. Terrible with shallots. Hopefully this doesn't make you cry. It probably will. And then we're just going to take our couple of capers. We're going to rough chop those quickly. We're going to add that into the mix. And now we're going to take the other half of the lemon that we just zested into the yogurt. I'm going to zest it onto here and then we're also going to juice it. So we're going to start to marinate the tomatoes and the shallots and the capers while we get the rest of dinner ready and then we'll fold in the fresh herbs to finish. So we'll zest that. Just a little, just a little hand squeeze. We're Cut using the sieve too. Okay. And we'll squeeze it through. Beautiful. Get all the juice in there. When we get to plating our dish a little later, it'll be nice to have a little extra juice, a little extra vinaigrette, if you will, to dress the fish, give a little bit more moisture back to it. Mm -hmm. Little shot of olive oil. And then mix that all together so it can start marinating for us over the next 20-30 minutes. Now to finish the sauce vierge, we're going to use the rest of the herbs that we have with us. So we have some parsley, some chives, and some tarragon. If you want to help me start picking the parsley. I suppose I can do that. We're going to leave this as well. You can chop this as fine as you want. You can leave it nice and leafy. For mine, I'm probably going to leave it a little more uh, on, the, on the chunky side, on the, on the thicker side. I'd like my sauce vierge kind of similar to what we're doing with the vegetarian dish. And we're going to make it a nice, uh, delicious, aromatic herb salad. And by keeping it a little chunkier, a little more rustic. It's just gonna, I think it, it eats a little nicer. I always thought it was sauce fairish. Well, am I just pronouncing it wrong? Or? Everybody learns something new. Everybody okay, does. fair enough. Fair enough. I think you missed a couple of the vowels. That will happen from time to time. Beautiful. Are we picking all this now or? Uh, this will work. This will be okay. good for us. So like the, the dill and the mint, we're just going to run our knife through it quickly. Don't get my finger. I'm coming in. Try not to. It's my first time with a knife. <laughs> and then we can just put that on top of the salad so that it doesn't get, uh, so that it's not sitting in the liquid and so the acid doesn't start breaking it down. We're going to go through the chives. We don't need to get 
too fine with them. We're gonna get, probably cut half of this bundle. And same thing, we're gonna scoop them up and let them sit on top of the other herbs, trying to avoid them from sitting in the liquid too much so that we can try and keep them a little fresher, a little fuller for when it comes time to plating our, our fish when we're all done. Beauty. So am I putting this in the fridge? Yes, please. You can do that. All right. So next we're gonna start preparing our zucchini so that it's ready to start pan searing. I'm gonna teach everybody a technique called scoring. So scoring is a technique used in the food industry, typically on proteins that have a big fat cap on them. And by cutting a diamond pattern into the fat cap, it helps us sear, it helps keep the fat cap flat while you're searing it. And it also helps it crisp up a little slower as opposed to steaming the meat when the meat folds over onto itself. So tonight we're going to score the zucchini for the purpose of helping us keep it flat while it's down in the pan searing in the hot oil. And also it's going to look really nice when we cut our big wedges out of it, but when we take it to the plate. So just any sort of knife we'll do on this one or? Yeah. So I like to use a paring knife. It's a little okay. easier to hold in your hand. You have a little more control with it. And so we're going to start by holding the zucchini flesh side up and at a 45 degree angle, we're going to just start to put little slits in the flesh about an eighth of an inch deep and work our way across the flesh, just moving slowly and carefully. Is it going to make a huge difference if they're off a little bit or? Absolutely not. No, okay. so it just mine, won't look as pretty. Yeah, mine's not going to turn out perfect, but I've been practicing and we're going to take the zucchini. We're going to flip it 45 degrees. And we're gonna go back in the flesh doing the same thing from the other direction. And you're not going very deep here either. Huh? No, just... just looking to go about an eighth of an inch deep. We don't wanna ruin the flesh. We just wanna be able to, to flex the zucchini a little more and to be able to hold it a little more stable in the pan. And so. It's, go... it's weirdly mesmerizing. Right to the end. There we we go. have our diamond pattern. So we're going to do it one more time. Do you want to try this or do you want me to keep I mean, going? I'll give it a shot really quick here. Right, here you go. I'm going to use my knife though because I don't know what kind of fancy rig you've got there. But uh, we're just going to go across. I probably went a little deep there, but... Watch your fingers. This is years of, of art school here paying off. Steady hand. So yeah, so it doesn't matter. You can go a little wider in between each of your cuts. It really makes no difference. It's really a practice and repetition thing. And even still to this day, I've probably done this to hundreds of duck breasts and I still don't love the appearance of 50, 50 plus percent of them. I'm gonna actually speed it up a little bit here. Yeah. Danger zone. Just be careful. Add a little drama for the filming. Oh, look at that. I think I actually did a pretty good job. Nice work. Not bad for an oyster shucker. There you go. I like it. All right, so now we have the zucchini ready to go. I'm gonna put it into a pan. I'm just gonna set it off to the side. And we're gonna grab our piece of fish. So people cooking fish with us tonight, we're all gonna be eating a piece of fresh BC ling cod. The ling cod is caught uh, near the Queen Charlotte Islands around the Hecate Strait. And it's been supplied to us tonight by our friends at Seafood City in Granville Island, my friend Brian. Brian and his family have been running Seafood City for 35 plus years wow. at Granville Island for 35 years. And they had a family meat shop for, I think, about five or six years before that in the Oak Ridge area. So if you are able to go down to Seafood City and help support local, Brian's a great guy. He specializes in Japanese fish. He brings in exotics from New Zealand. Uh, he also has a great supply of anything off of the Pacific coast. Like I said, he's a really nice guy. If you have any questions, I'm sure he'll have the answer for you. So we're going to take our ling cod and we're just going to set it up beside the oven. We're going to try and slowly bring it up to temperature uh, before we start pan searing it. When you cook a protein from room temperature, it cooks a lot more even and it'll help us develop a nicer crust on the outside. So we're just gonna set both of these up beside awesome. the oven to start tempering. 
And at this point, I'm going to start getting the risotto ready and we're going to start cooking the risotto. So now that our vegetable stock is, is nice and warm, I'm just going to take our pan and the wider, if you have a nice wide pan, it's going to help cook your rice a little more evenly. If you're cooking it in a, a like a, a taller pot, you're going to just start to overcook the parts of the rice instead of letting it cook nice and evenly in a nice wide flat base. So I'm going to turn the burner on and I'm going to start by adding a quarter cup of a vegetable stock to the pan. And then we can introduce our rice to the nice warm stock. So now grab our pot of rice, wait for this to warm up for us. So, so now that things are going to start to pick up a little bit in the kitchen as well, if you have questions, feel free at any point, we're going to answer them as they come along here. So we'll be cooking dinner along with you guys Saturday, November 14th. So please just keep them coming and we'll answer them as best as we can. Better believe it. Uh, so now I have, I'm going to turn this up a little bit to get started. I'm going to add our risotto rice into our vegetable stock. So the rice is just barely cooked. So I've put a liter of rice, a liter of stock into a kilogram of rice. So really all I've done is started to wake up the starches in the rice and we're just gonna finish the cooking process over the next 10, 15 minutes and then start to season it. The rice right now is completely unseasoned. So please taste your risotto as we're cooking it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's palate's a little bit differently. I'm gonna put a lot of lemon and a lot of salt into mine because that's how I like to eat. Absolutely. And if you are a little more sensitive to salt and to acid, then by all means, pull it back, just do it. You have to eat the dish when we're all done, so make sure that you enjoy what's going to hit your plate. The more salt, the merrier. Thin that blood right out. So Now our rice is starting to warm up a little bit. Uh, we cook arborio rice. Arborio is the type of rice that we use when we're cooking risotto. Uh, it's a really starchy grain of rice, so never rinse the rice. We want to use those starches to develop its own nice little sauce as it continues to cook. And by using hot stock or warm stock in this instance, we're helping cook the grains nice and evenly. If we start the rice in cold stock, it's gonna shock the grain and it's gonna be overcooked on the inside, it's gonna be hard on the outside, and it's just really not what you think of when you think of a nice creamy al dente risotto. I would have never known that, so that's good to know. Always warm stock and always season your food towards the end of cooking. If we put my lemon zest and my lemon juice into this pan right now while we're cooking it, it could have the potential to turn bitter on us. And that's also just not a flavor profile many people are looking for when you're thinking of a nice, fresh, lemony risotto. Now I have the pot going at a decent pace and I'm gonna turn it down so that I can control the speed. If you find that you have your element too high, by all means, turn it down. If it's too low, turn it up. It's really at your discretion, the pace that we're going to cook the risotto. Uh, you have to be comfortable with it. You have to be, you have to enjoy doing this. It shouldn't be, make you nervous. It shouldn't make you feel like you're doing it wrong. We're just going to cook it nice and slow and watch it cook. We're going to watch the starch develop and then we're going to season it up when we're all done. So are you just waiting for all that liquid to disappear in there as well over time? Yeah, so we're okay. just going to cook this a little, bit of, a little bit of broth at a time. We're going to cook it out. We're going to bring, cook all the liquid into the rice. And then once we can see that it still needs a little bit more, we're going to put a little, we're going to put more broth into the pot and that's going to okay. flush more starch out of it. And by cooking it slowly and by uh, reintroducing more stock to it as we cook, it's just gonna keep releasing more and more starch, which is really what everybody is looking for when they're cooking risotto and eating it. Yep. So now I have my rice is a little, started to soak up this liquid. I'm gonna add another quarter cup of liquid to it. And I'm gonna pass it to John. And John is gonna slowly watch it on the other side of the stove while I start to get 
Well, I start to sear the cod, and then we're going to start to sear the zucchini, and we're going to start to get close with dinner. So I'll pass this off to you. Awesome. Uh, please, if you are able to grab or have an extra dry cloth around, I recommend specifically keeping one dry cloth handy because we're going to go in and out of the oven for a little bit. So if you have a wet cloth, it's going to burn right through and that's not what anybody wants to be doing tonight. We have lots of nice burns and scars, so don't repeat that. It's not a, not a badge of honor by any means. It's usually just trying to rush through things and this is not a sprint, it's a marathon, so take your time. It's supposed to be fun. Yeah. It's not supposed to hurt. Plus with these bad boy pots too, they're very, very heavy. The heat travels right up the handle as well. Um, so definitely make sure you have a rag on him. So now I'm warming up a pan to start searing my fish. You'll notice that I don't have a, a plastic cover on the handle. If you're using a pan that ha uh, a frying pan that has a plastic handle on it, if you have something else handy, I advise that you use that because it's going to go into the oven and it could potentially melt on you. Or you can use that pan and then we'll flip it back into an oven safe dish after we're done searing the fish. So now I'm warming up my pan to sear the fish and I'm going to use canola oil to sear it. I use canola oil because it has a lot higher burning point and it has a lot higher smoking point than say using uh, an extra virgin olive oil which is used more to finish food with. It's not really used to cook unless you're doing it lowly at, at real gentle heats. So I use canola oil. Uh, my mother-in-law likes to cook in avocado oil which surprisingly has a really high smoking and burning point as well so if you have that on hand by all means if you want to avoid the canola or vegetable oil uh, you can use that no problem how's your liquid it's looking good okay yeah it's uh it's definitely reducing if you um, need more i'm just gonna pass this over to perfect. you yeah. keep it on low yeah perfect now that my pan the oil is starting to get a nice little shimmer to it. I can see that it's warming up by uh, the pace that it's moving around the pan. I'm going to season my fish. I haven't seasoned my fish yet because you don't want to put salt on it too early. If you salt any type of protein or the zucchini for that matter, it's going to start to pull all the moisture out of it and then it's not going to sear because all that moisture is going to be on the surface of the flesh. So now that we're ready to get going, I'm going to do a little sprinkle of salt. And I'm hoping this isn't going to kill our audio, but we are going to turn the fan up a little bit here simply because I have a very sensitive fire alarm in my house. Um, you really don't want that to go off, I promise you. So. And now we're going to start. I can see that my oil is just about there. So I'm going to just put my fish in flesh side down. We're going to put it right in the oil and start cooking it. Now that I have the fish in the pan, I'm gonna use, I can, I'll use my fingers to push a little bit of weight onto the fish so that we can try and get a nice even crust. If you feel more comfortable with a spoon or a palette knife to do that, you can do that. My fingers are a little, have been burnt many, many times, so it doesn't really bother me all that much. John's a little more sensitive, so. Way more sensitive. He might need to just ask me to cook this piece. All right, so now we have a nice crust set on this. I'm gonna leave it on that same side. And I'm gonna put it into the oven to start baking. And I'm gonna set an eight minute timer for that fish. Now our fish is going, I'm gonna start warming up the pan to sear our zucchini. So I am gonna have this pan about a medium heat. We're going to use a pretty similar heat to what we did the fish with because we're going to try and get a nice caramelization on the flesh of that. So same thing, we're going to do a little bit of canola oil, vegetable oil if you have, avocado oil even. Just going to let that start to warm up. If you can pass me the zucchini please. Absolutely. And just like the fish, at this point, I'll season it. I'm going to season both sides so that when we're eating it, 
You got salt on both sides. I'm gonna oil. Are you just using like a basic kosher salt there? Or? Yeah, so okay. I'm using kosher salt. It's a little bit finer of a grain, or sorry, it's a little coarser of a grain than a table salt. You just find that it eats really nicely. It's not super aggressive. Um, yeah, it's a delicious salt. I, I like use it. diamond crystal, it's the red box. I think it's my favorite salt. Most people don't have a favorite salt, but I work <laughs> with it every day, so I yeah. do. And now I'm just gonna test the heat on the pan. We're nice and hot. Oh, so yeah. same thing, I'm gonna use my fingers. I'm just gonna press onto this. I wouldn't recommend that at home. Maybe use a spatula. Yeah, my uh, wife works for the bank and she tells me that this hurts her banker fingies, but like We I don't all have catcher mitts for hands, like so. Like said, uh, I can't even feel this right now. <laughs> now that it's released from the oil, I'm going to move on to the second piece. And just going to push her down, make sure that our oil is coming nice. It's a hot. Leave that for a second. We'll check on the color. And once we start to have a little bit of caramelization on the flesh, we're going to put it into the oven because we're going to let the heat of the oven continue to caramelize, continue to heat it. So let's check on that. Not quite there. So I'm going to give that another 30 seconds. Keep going. Keep, I'm going to keep pushing this around so it doesn't stick on us. Mm -hmm. And then we won't have issues releasing it when it's done cooking. So because of the scoring, it's going to absorb a lot more of the oil and stuff as well? Yeah, so the okay. oil and the salt will also penetrate the flesh, if you will, of the zucchini. Okay. But like I said also, you're gonna notice that it's not curling up on us. It's staying nice and flat in the pan. So that's not an issue. Check on this again. A little bit of caramelization going on. First piece. Check you really piece. want to brown that though, right? Check our second okay. piece. Yeah, so that's what the oven's gonna help us with. It's gonna keep cooking this side and it's gonna give us a nice color. So I'm gonna put that into the oven we got our color going on. We're gonna check on that in about four minutes. Okay. Now that that's going, I'm gonna steal the risotto back from yeah, you. Please do, because I actually fell asleep at the wheel there. So, and we're gonna start to season our rice up. So, I'm gonna turn my heat on this pan down. I'm gonna add a little bit more liquid to it. Let's shut this off too. Here, there we go. And now at this point, I'm gonna to start to season our rice. I can see with my eyes that the grains have started to open up, it's starting to look like it's nice and cooked. We're getting the starch, we're getting its nice natural sauce in there. So now I'm just gonna put about a half a tablespoon of salt in. A little more because I like salt. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna grab the butter, the lemon, and the Parmesan. Okay. We're gonna bring that over to here. Actually, I'm going to give this back to you because yeah, we're going to use that again. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to put all of the butter in. Actually, no, I'm going to put, save a little bit of butter because we're going to use a little bit of it for our beans. You used about three quarters, three quarters of it there. So. Yeah. Okay. And now we're going to start, I'm going to zest and juice this entire lemon into my rice. Now I'm gonna to ask too for the butter, should that, that's another thing that should be sitting out at room temperature, right? You yep. don't wanna to toss that in cold? No, it's gonna it's gonna melt nice and fast on us. Okay. Uh, if it's warm, we don't want it hot, we don't want it melting, we like it to keep holding its shape. Okay. But if we take it out of the fridge, uh, just like a cold stock, it's gonna shock the grains a little bit and it's gonna regress the process of our nice starchy risotto. Noted. Can I get you to cut that in half? I for sure me? can. And pass me the strainer back. I'm gonna keep mixing this in so that our butter melts in. You can squeeze that right in there. All right. There we go. It's starting to smell real good. Now that we have all of our citrus in here, I'm going to check on my seasoning quickly. And then, oh yeah, 
That's tasty. Uh, now that the seasoning is good, I'm just going to continue to cook the liquid into the rice. And when it's almost all absorbed, I'm going to throw in our kale. And I'm also going to finish it with some Parmesan. And then we're going to pull it off the side. So I've given everybody uh, that is okay to eat dairy, I've given everyone a little piece of Parmesan. We're going to grab our handheld grater. We're going to grate that back into the rice here. For our lactose friends, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I don't know how I would live without cheese. More salt and more lemon. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. yeah. And you can, like stuff like nutritional yeast and stuff like that does help as well. Yeah. It does, it packs a punch. It's got a lot of flavor. Uh, my wife's vegetarian, so we do a lot of veggie cooking at home. Um, we use a lot of nutritional yeast, so. Cheese is in there. I'm gonna grab our kale. I'm just going to be careful not to grab any of our beans out of the package. We're just going to pour all of the kale into the rice. Put the kale, I use a, a black kale also known as a lacinado. It's also called dinosaur kale. Uh, I use this in this application because it's a little milder than say your typical green or curly kale. It uh, absorbs a lot of flavor. It's really mild. It's really tasty. So I've just wilted it down very quickly into our rice. We're going to pull it off the heat and that guy's done. And we're going to check on our fish and our zucchini. And I can see that my fish is almost cooked through. I'm going to flip it onto the other side. And we're just gonna put it back into the oven to finish. If you weren't able to use an oven safe pan, or an oven safe frying pan, and you had to move it to a different pan, uh, you can roast it face up like this. It doesn't need to be cooked the whole way on the flesh side. If we haven't been searing it in the oil, it's actually gonna roast nicer if we leave it with this side up. And so I'll put this back into the oven for a minute. Now we're just gonna check on our zucchini. It's nice and golden. We're gonna flip that over. Actually, this is ready. So I'm gonna take this. Uh, can you pass me one of the pieces of paper towel, please? Absolutely. And I'm just gonna put the zucchini onto my transfer pan with a little piece of paper towel and it's just going to help us soak up the grease from it. And now our zucchini is completely done cooking and it'll be ready to plate. So if I can get you to just transfer that back over there. This guy? Yep. Perfect. And now I'm going to use this pan instead of dirtying up another pan. We're just going to deglaze our nice hot zucchini pan. Turn the heat back on for us. So we're gonna deglaze the pan and we're gonna use all the nice juices that have come out of the zucchini and we're gonna start to glaze our beans in them. So we have a little bit of oil. I'm gonna add the, le the little bit that's left of the butter into here. I'm just gonna make that into a nice mix. I'm gonna melt that in. And then we're just gonna warm our beans back up. The beans have been blanched very gently also just to kind of help speed up the process for everybody tonight and also to eliminate having an extra pot on the stove. For those of us that don't know, blanching, just a quick, quick cook, a little boiling water. Yeah, so a blanch uh, is, you can blanch stuff in water, you can blanch stuff in hot oil, but okay. for, this, for this, we've just done the beans into hot water for about 30 seconds into an ice bath and then drained. Okay. And then it allows us stop to them from cooking. To okay. stop them from cooking in the in the ice water. And once we have it nice and cooked and par cooked for us, just partially cooked, we can just warm it up nicely and gently in here. And it's uh, it's a trick that we do in the restaurants because it just speeds up cooking process. Um, it also leaves more space on the stove for us to use in uh, in a dinner service. Okay. So beans are starting to get nice and warm. I'm gonna do a little sprinkle, about a half a teaspoon of butter on those guys. Just gonna continue to move those around. 
and the liquid. These guys are ready to go. And now I know our fish is ready, so I'm just gonna come out and grab that. You can see how beautiful this piece of fish is. Now that uh, our fish is nice and cooked, I'm just gonna ask you to pass me the transfer pan. Absolutely. And then another piece of piece or two of the paper towel. And then Absolutely. I'm just gonna blot off all the excess juice from our fish. And we're also gonna do the same with the beans. And this is just to help us when we take it to the plate uh, to eliminate all the extra liquid from running around on our plate. So I'm just gonna go over here. So we can put all the beans just right on there with the fish, unless I guess there's a vegetarian at the house as well, maybe yep. separate it. Exactly, but, so okay. for us, we're just eating, the f well, we're eating both the dishes, but I'm not too worried about the juice from the fish on my zucchini dinner. No. Now I'm just gonna bring this back over to the cutting board and we're gonna start to plate. Uh, if you, John, if you could just double check that the risotto Absolutely. is hot. Yeah, yes. And then we will grab the rest of our cold mise en place that we set up at the beginning and we will be all ready to start plating dinner. It looks good, should I bring it over? Yes, please. Awesome. And then if you could pass me the black plate mm -hmm. and then the yogurt and the herb salad with the dill and mint from the fridge, please. So we're gonna take our risotto. I'm just gonna start to put it down in the center of our plate. I'm gonna move it around. We're just gonna, doesn't need to be perfectly smooth. It doesn't need to be perfectly round. This is a really nice dish by showing uh, once we cut the zucchini, you'll see a lot of the texture that we're gonna put together. So we're just gonna leave this nice and chunky and different levels of height. Awesome. Actually, we'll trade this. Okay. We're gonna grab some of our beans. We're just gonna start to crisscross them on the top of the plate. We're gonna have a little bit of fun going to show some, some shapes, we're going to show different textures, we're going to show different heights. Use your artistic flair. Yes, please. Have a little fun with this. Don't think that it needs to look a specific way. And then I'm going to take my zucchini and I'm going to just start to cut it into different shape wedges. And then we're going to shingle it through the beans on the plate. I guess you could leave it whole if you wanted to, but I find it's just easier to eat with the chopped. It does look prettier on the yeah. plate as well. It'll definitely cut a little bit easier for you if you start to, to break it into smaller pieces for your plate. We're just gonna shingle this around our beans. And while you're doing that, if at any point a cat comes into frame, it's because I have multiple cats and uh, they seem to have broken loose. So we're just gonna keep rolling though. Hopefully they don't eat our dinner. No. <laughs> now we have our yogurt. I'm just gonna start to put the yogurt once again, just nice and randomly throughout our shingled zucchini. Just kind of spreading that all over the dish. Yeah, a couple of nice pieces. If it starts to melt into your risotto, it's not gonna taste awful. It might actually help. Okay. And then if you could have the herb salad, I'm just gonna season the herb salad with a little bit of salt and olive oil, and that's all it needs. And we're gonna put that on top as well. Beautiful. Just nice and all over the cheese. This is actually making me hungry. I didn't eat anything today. I was trying to look as schvelt as possible. So it worked. Um, 
And there's also a vegan option to this as well with removing the yogurt, right? Yeah, so without the yogurt, you can save a little bit of your lemon throughout the cooking process if you want to season the salad with a little bit of lemon, or you can also just finish the zucchini itself with a little bit of lemon for a little extra bite of acidity, a little bit more crisp, fresh flavor. Awesome. And that will eat just totally fine. Yeah, so maybe even if you don't, Maybe if you do eat dairy, maybe you just prefer that anyways, and that's yeah. definitely an option. It's not so. the wrong move. Yeah. And then here we'll present to you with our first dish, our zucchini. Now we're going to start plating our lingcod. So we're going to give a little tidy here. If you can pull this aside, Absolutely. I'll grab that clean plate. Perfect. I'll get we'll that set out it up here. over here. And then we're going to do something very similar with this. Uh, with this plate, we're going to do the risotto, the beans, the fish, and we also have our sauce vierge that's still in the fridge. So if you could pass me that guy, please. Or verge. Sauce verge. There we go. So here we are. We have our tomatoes that are nice and acidulated from sitting in the oil and lemon juice for the last little bit. The shallot, the caper, we're all starting to soak up all that, all that liquid. Take a spoon from you, and at this point, we can mix our herbs into the liquid. And now those will start to soak up the liquid. And now we still have the nice crispness of the leaves, but they've also been dressed with the acid and the olive oil. So now we have this, it's all ready to go. I will ask you to pass me the risotto. Absolutely. And a spoon one Perfect. last time. And for this guy, we're just going to start to put it. Actually, I might ask you to grab the spatula. Yeah, absolutely. It liquid. Done deal. You can do risotto right into the middle of the plate. We're going to keep this plate a little simpler, a little more traditional than the zucchini plate. I'll pass that back. Sounds good. We'll take some of our beans. We'll set those up in a nice straight line. You don't have to use these fancy tweezers. I would be using my hands right now, so no one's going to hold that against you if you do that. And now that we have that there, we put our fish right on top. I will pass you this guy. Perfect. Spin this towards you so you can see what we're working with. And now we can start to put our sauce vierge right on top of the fish and like I was saying earlier we're gonna use all that delicious liquid and we're gonna season the rest of the dish with it. It's a really simple garnish eh? but just packs a lot of punch. And really delicious, really fresh, yeah, yeah. very classical French, uh, I was about to call it a dressing, they might call it that, but a nice classical French fish sauce. We can finish it with a little bit more fresh olive oil. Make sure you're using good olive oil too. And here we have our BC lingcod with kale, risotto, and sauce vierge. Now that everybody has dinner in front of them, let's uh, let John talk about what we're going to recommend everybody drink with dinner tonight. Yeah, and we're not going to get too wild into, you know, how wine is made, but this stuff right here pairs very nicely with what we're about to eat. Um, as much as I love drinking red wine, I would try to stay away from it as much as possible. We're dealing with some very delicate uh, textures and tastes. Um, so you don't want to overpower your meal with a really, really full bodied wine. If you are going red, light Pinot. That's the best suggestion I can give you for you on that one. Um, you just don't want anything with uh, too high in tannin and too jammy. It's just going to take away from the flavor of the fish. So what we've done, um, we've got uh, some kind of grainier, crisper wines here, um, all from the Okanagan as well. A couple of these guys are small batch, but we'll start off, um, if you like bubbles, which I do, um, it's great with OJ as well in the morning. Um, not that I'm an alcoholic, I'm not. Anyways, even if I was, that would be okay. But uh, we've got Nickel Vineyard. This is one of the oldest vineyards in the Naramata Bench. I do believe they're like the second or third oldest. Um, so they're, they were really part of the whole wine movement in the Okanagan. Um, this guy here is an extra brute rosé, so it's got that kind of pale pink color. 
That's just from uh, grape skin contact. They leave it on there for a little bit extra just so you get that nice color on there, um, just rather than a traditional uh, bubble. Um, so an extra brut noir is also a, a blank de noir. Um, I'm not French, so that probably came off pretty poorly. But this is a very, very crisp and dry wine. It's not gonna overpower your dish, um, but it is very nice on the palate. Um, moving on here, we'll go over to the side actually. We'll stick with the Okanagan. This guy's also from Naramata Bench. This is a fantastic winery. It's small batch, um, meaning they only do very small batches of their wine. They just don't have as much property. These grapes in particular are from just outside of Okanagan Falls. They bring it into Naramata Bench. It's a natural winery, so you're gonna see uh, more sediment in the bottom. Don't be afraid of that stuff. That's just uh, more bang for your buck. But this is a really nice Chardonnay that they age in an oak barrel. Um, compared to most really strong Californian um, Chardonnays, I, I don't find this one to be as quite overpowering. And that's what we're trying to stay away from with the fish here. So as traditional as Sauvignon Blancs are, um, just trying to choose something a little bit different for your wine here. And the other nice thing about Lockenworth is the price point. The price point on this is fantastic. You're gonna typically see most of their wines in the 20s. They have a nice rosé as well. Their reds are great. So if you ever get the chance, definitely support them. And then this is something a little bit newer. Um, wines are really making um, a strong case on Vancouver Island. So this is from, uh, I never say this properly, but uh, Saanich. 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 So just outside of Victoria, this is Rathjen Cellars. It's a Pinot Gris. If you like Pinot Grigios, guess what? That's what a Pinot Gris is. Um, fantastic wine, light and crisp. You kind of get their lemon and apple notes on there. I'm a sucker for a nice label as well. I kind of like this uh, wax the seal wax that they have on there. Is it gonna make the wine taste different? No, but is it nice on the eyes? Absolutely. So once again, because we're dealing with a lingcod here uh, and a vegetarian dish, um, the lingcod is like a medium firm fish. So you've got your lighter, your lighter fish like a haddock. Um, and then with a medium firm fish, you've got the lingcod, which we've chosen, uh, halibut, um, hake, which is actually probably one of the most popular fish around our bodies of water that people don't know about as much, but hake's fantastic. Another name for that is Pacific whiting. I diverge, and then a more firm bodied fish would be salmon. So this is a lighter fish, delicate textures, light and flaky, so you don't wanna overpower this meal with a big heavy wine by any means. So we've got the Lockenworth Chardonnay, we've got the Rathjen Cellars Pinot Gris, and then we're looking at the Nickel Vineyard, nice rosé, bubbly there. So now that we know what we're eating, what we're drinking, let's take a minute and talk about why we're here with the Rotary Club of Lionsgate tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are the team at Salt and Earth Catering Company, um, and we thought what better way than to raise a little bit of money for the kids. That's why we're here, that's why we're chatting with you, that's why we're cooking the food. This whole song and dance is to give back. Um, it's a fantastic cause with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, what's the name of the camp again? We're helping send kids to Camp Potlatch. Yeah. And before we send you over to the video, it's, I, I've been that kid that growing up in Nova Scotia, I've been to these sort of camps and stuff like that. I grew up with uh, a single mom at a young age and to get that support to be able to go to a summer camp means the world to me. It's some of my most cherished memories growing up. So. It's really fantastic that we're able to, to do this collaboration with the Rotarians. So, Absolutely. Um, in the meantime, check out this video by the Boys and Girls Club. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Ian. My name is Juliana. My name is Abby Paris. My name is Brooklyn McNeil and I work at Camp Potlatch. I really do think it's the people um, that make it special here. I think that that's, that's what it was for me and I think that that's what it is for a lot of the kids is the relationships that they have with the, with the counselors and with the other kids. I want to say freedom. Freedom in the sense, like freedom to be themselves, knowing that they'll be supported no matter what they are, or who they are, or who they choose to be. Knowing that um, their counselors are always looking out for them above themselves. And really being safe and being 
loved and like accepted and supported. It's a safe place that they can come and have fun and be themselves. I think a huge part of it was just like the people, that, like the friends I made and the counselors and like the, the impressions that they made on me and um, yeah, I just felt like so cared about and, um, and when I did come back, like people remembered you and they were excited to see you and yeah, I just felt so welcoming to step off the boat again and experience like, yeah, just be out in like completely in the wilderness, which is so different from any other camp. I'd been to camps before, but I'd never been to a camp like this. So when I got that, it made me feel good about myself. It made me feel like someone sees something in me that maybe I didn't see in myself. When we had the opportunity to um, be in a cabin for three days with the youngest girls, I remember just doing all the activities with them and uh, watching the counselors that were in the cabin with them and kind of thinking that this is something that I might want to do. I really enjoyed having the opportunity to watch other staff and learn from them. Um, and kind of put all of that into, into my own work with kids. All right, so we've cooked some meals, zucchini, lingcod. What's next? It's time to eat dessert. Time to eat something a little sweet. And what do you got? Uh, tonight we're serving a vegan, gluten-free, uh, chocolate-layered sponge cake served with raspberry coulis. And I've paired it with a coconut whipped cream because it is vegan and we wanted to be able to appeal to everybody that's eating tonight. We wanted everybody to enjoy this. We didn't want someone to not have a nice creamy whip on their plate, so we have gone with a coconut whipped cream. So that's just about the only ingredient that we haven't had from BC for this meal, but for the sake of this, we'll say that these coconuts are from the Okanagan, so. It's pretty nice there. Absolutely. So we're gonna start with our raspberry coulis. We're just gonna start to put it on the plate in a circular motion. We're gonna take our piece of cake next. And I'm gonna set it just off-centered on top of the coulis. Now we're gonna take our whipped cream. We're just gonna put a little dollop of the coconut whip on top of the, of the cake. Set it on top. Nice, that looks great. A little bit of our chopped hazelnuts to take us home. Scattered on the plate, a little bit more nuts. And then just our mint that we saved from our herb bundles earlier tonight, right in there to, oh, to lighten it up. That looks pretty damn sharp. Thank you. It looks like a, a fancy Instagram or Facebook dessert that I see all the time. I think it'll eat pretty well too. We like that, so nice work. And with that, we're going to send it to Stan to finish up for the night. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Stan Van Werkens, the president at the Rotary Club of Lionsgate in North Vancouver. Amid all our own daily challenges, we have one challenge we can help solve together. Every day, a child in our immediate vicinity cannot afford a meal, let alone afford an overnight camp or a series of day camps. Every child deserves a healthy meal and play with their friends. We have an outstanding community that comes together during challenging times. For years, we have supported the Boys and Girls Club. We're asking you to rally the troops around your family, friends and colleagues to enjoy a local sourced meal. With your money, we will support the Boys and Girls Club and send children to camps who otherwise don't have a chance to do so. If you have the chance to do something for somebody else, then you should do so now. Visit RotaryLionsgate.com. Thank you for supporting A Taste for Charity. This is a special thanks to Chefs Jonah and John at Salt and Earth. Till the next time with the Rotary Club of Lionsgate. Stay together, stay healthy.